So good evening. It's a great pleasure to have the chance to tell you a little bit about our research here at the Institute for Molecular Engineering. So all of you should be aware, uh, especially if you're over 40 or 45 years old, that you're actually living through a technological revolution that we call the digital age. So there's some images up here on the screen of products uh, that you're familiar with that you use every day. But you need to think about the way that uh, these products have changed the way we live, the way we communicate with one another, the way we generate, store, save, use information, uh, and how it's brought uh, 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 the world to be more a global society. So another way to illustrate this point is to show you this advertisement from 25 years ago in 1991 from Radio Shack of all these electronic devices that were available for sale. And all of those devices are now contained in, a, in your smartphone. Uh, amazing, just 25 years ago. So really uh, revolutionary, and uh, I think it's worthwhile taking a, a few minutes to think about uh, how different your lives are now than they were 25 years ago because of these developments. So there's uh, less obvious uh, things that have uh, uh, come out of uh, the availability of faster and more powerful integrated circuits. This is a picture of uh, Mira, which is a supercomputer uh, at Argonne National Laboratory. And there's so many things I could mention for how it's changed our world. Uh, but this was a list I found on the web uh, for the uh, nine super cool uses for super uh, computers. So uh, uh, evaluating, uh, predicting earthquakes, for example, uh, uh, <coughs> recreating or understanding the origins of the universe, uh, et cetera. So again, all of these uh, developments, this technological revolution that we are experiencing uh, is directly related to being able to make and fabricate more and more devices called transistors on one surface, okay? And this uh, 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 is known as Moore's Law. It's really an observation that he made uh, in the late 60s and early 70s uh, that it seemed as though the number of transistors that you could make on a CPU on a computer chip was doubling every two years. And so if we think about that ad for 1991, there were approximately a million uh, devices on a computer chip. And in 2016, 25 years uh, from that date, there's now five billion, okay? Exponential growth over that time period. And of course, that's what's responsible for being uh, able to do all of these uh, uh, great things even that we've heard from, from uh, David and Suprate. Okay, so uh, to bring that home a little bit uh, further in the manufacturer, here I show actual images of devices uh, at relative scale uh, for different years. And so if you're gonna double every two years, that means you're gonna quadruple the number of devices every four years. And if you think about it, if you shrink the, uh, the area of a device by two, that means you can fit four devices where you could only fit one device uh, uh, previously. So if you look at the uh, images for uh, 2004 and 2008, you see that they roughly shrank exactly by a factor of two. Okay, so I wanna explain to you a little bit more about how semiconductor devices are manufactured so you can understand our research a little bit better. So I included a few cross sections of devices here uh, of modern uh, computer chips. Uh, the devices that I'm talking about are way down here and that you can't even see them. Uh, and then these are all the layers of wires or interconnects that are made to make the devices function. And so just from looking at one of these cross sections, you can see one that you're patterning at very long, small length scales, but that you make these devices in a layer by layer fashion, perhaps 25 to 30 different layers. And so each layer has to uh, be made so that it connects properly with the one under it and connects properly with the one on top of it. So you have to align these patterns perfectly, that's called registration. And then if you think of the numbers of layers, if there's even one defect in any layer, the device doesn't work. And so perfection is absolutely necessary uh, for these devices to be made. So again, I want to get down to the actual process of making this device. So let's look at, say, one of these layers of wires here that are called interconnects. Uh, and these are wires of copper that are separated by an insulator, a dielectric material. And to make just that one layer would require this series of steps. We would deposit a dielectric on top of the device layer. Uh, we'd coat that with a polymer called a photoresist, and now I want to explain to you the process of photolithography. We'd expose that photoresist to light, 
And where that polymer is exposed to light, it changes chemistry. And then if we bake the material a little bit, it changes chemistry a little bit more. And then if we plunge this material into an aqueous solution, basically water, uh, that exposed material will, will dissolve much more faster than the unexposed material, and that allows us to pattern this sacrificial layer. Then we could deposit copper everywhere, polish off the copper where we don't need it, and we'd arrive then at our one layer of, uh, of copper wires in this structure. So then to make uh, the overall device, we simply repeat that series of steps again and again and again and again, maybe 25 to 30 times, uh, to arrive at our uh, fully integrated circuit. And so obviously, again, to reiterate, uh, you need to be able to do this process at very small length scales. You have to be able to position each pattern perfectly, that's called registration, and you can tolerate no defects. Okay, so why can't we simply make uh, these, oh, one more uh, bit of perspective. Uh, if we think about, uh, David showed you uh, these uh, wafers and these ingots. Uh, they're now either 300 millimeters or 450 millimeters in diameter, and we can pattern hundreds of computer chips on just one of these wafers. So if each computer chip is five billion devices, and there's a hundred of them on the wafer, we've patterned more devices on one surface than there are people in the world by a factor of 100. And my colleagues at Intel tell me, this is the marvel of the engineering world, that there are times when every one of those devices is perfect. Can you imagine patterning that many perfect things all at once? Uh, it's unbelievable. Okay, so why can't we just continue to make smaller and smaller patterns? The problem is, is that uh, uh, as you do this exposure of the resist, uh, the photoresist through the mask, you can't simply keep uh, reducing the slit or the aperture that the light goes through because as it approaches the wavelength of the light, it undergoes a process called diffraction. So it, uh, you could make the slit smaller, but you would, you would not be able to make smaller features, okay? So for many, many years, it was very easy to go to smaller and smaller devices simply by reducing the wavelength of the light so that you could get the smaller apertures and smaller features. But that uh, strategy petered out uh, in about 2000 to 2005. So <clears throat> instead, uh, I'd like to pose a question to you. What would you do to go to smaller features if you had a tool that could only give you, say, 80 nanometer periods, uh, but you're at Intel and your boss says that you need to make 40 nanometer period structures? Uh, very difficult challenge. It turns out the concepts for doing this are not so difficult. So uh, here is one strategy, oh, sorry, where uh, called litho-etch, litho-etch, where you'd simply uh, do this process twice, and you'd have a machine that could so perfectly move that wafer back into position that you could put a 40 nanometer line right in between the two 40 nanometer lines at 80 nanometer pitch. That would be called litho-etch, litho-etch. That's actually in production. The second strategy, would be uh, what's called self-aligned double patterning. Uh, it turns out that you can very uh, uh, controllably conformally coat structures and control the thickness of the structure very, very well. Uh, so in this uh, strategy, you conformally coat that first resist structure uh, and then uh, uh, use the, the conformal coatings on the two sides ultimately to define the pattern at double the density of the original uh, pattern features. Okay, so finally, to get to our research, uh, we've been developing a, a process called directed self-assembly, and here we have the same tool that could give you, say, an 80 nanometer pitch uh, pattern, but instead of doing those other processes that I just described, we use the tool to make a chemical pattern. And then the idea is, could we simply deposit a material, a magic material, that responds to that uh, uh, chemical pattern that would assemble into these structures at higher density than the original pattern to allow you to get to smaller and smaller features. And this is the principle of uh, self-assembly. And this would be uh, uh, extremely useful because not only could you use it to double the resolution, for example, of the pattern, but you could potentially use it to triple and quadruple and even to go to higher factors of density multiplication. Okay, so the magic materials that we use, these self-assembly materials, are called block copolymers. 
There are two kinds of polymer chains connected at one end by a covalent bond. The two polymers aren't that, uh, aren't that uh, exotic. One is polystyrene, like the cup that you get a, on an airline, and the other is PMMA, that uh, is plexiglass that's in your screen door. But if you make two molecules and you bring them together and bind them at the molecular scale, they, they spontaneously form these self-assembled structures at very small length scales, at the molecular length scale. And in fact, they make the structures that you see uh, uh, different shapes and very uniform sizes at the length scale of three to 50 nanometers, which is what's very difficult to achieve in the process I was, I was just describing uh, by traditional lithography. So does it work? Uh, the answer is yes. So here's one of those magic materials that wants to make line and space patterns, lamellar structures. Uh, on one side is where we haven't told it what to do. We haven't directed its assembly, and it makes uh, this random, what we call a fin fingerprint structure. And when we give it direction on a chemical pattern, you can get it to perfectly assemble into these line spacers that are then useful for manufacturing. Uh, to give you a little flavor of, of the magic of this assembly, uh, here are some molecular simulations from my colleague Juan de Pablo uh, that shows you a very different process than what I described as photolithography, where now you're depositing this material and letting it spontaneously assemble with some direction into the structures that are then useful for the intended applications. Okay, so the biggest challenge in implementing this strategy in industry has been to show that you could reach these incredible levels of uh, uh, low levels of defects that are required for manufacturing computer chips. And to give you an idea of how uh, uh, incredible of a constraint that is, you need to be able to pattern perfectly and only have one defect in a 10 by 10 centimeter area. So if we were actually to take images where we could see the structures that we make, we would have to uh, look at 1.6 billion images to see and find out whether there's not more than just one of those defects in any of those 1.6 billion images. That's the level of defectivity that's required. Well, it turns out we had the, uh, this is one of the hallmarks of, uh, of the Institute for Molecular Engineering is finding the tools and the skills that you need. Uh, the actual first graduate of the Institute, Paulina uh, Rencon de Godillo, uh, was one of my students that went to IMEC, a consortium in Belgium, to be able to utilize the specialized tools to find that answer is could we reach the defect levels that are necessary using the strategy that I described. And the answer was yes, and here are some images then of, uh, uh, these are 14 nanometer uh, lines and spaces, or actually these are 10 nanometer lines and spaces, so ahead of what's necessary for uh, uh, manufacturing at present. Uh, perfect and over the areas of, uh, that I was describing as, as needed. So to give you one more um, uh, perspective of scale, these 50, nanom uh, 50 uh, lines and spaces are about a micron uh, wide, and if I were to compare that entire 50 nanometer line and space to the width of a human hair, it would be just that little spot uh, that you can barely see as it shrank uh, uh, to the length scale of the hair. Okay, so our current research uh, is to understand the three-dimensional structure of these assemblies. So unlike traditional uh, processing, they can be three-dimensional. And actually, the position of these uh, uh, lines and spaces can change as you move along the structures. And so this is usually utilizing specialized tools at Argonne National Laboratory to do what's called transmission electron microscopy tomography uh, to image these structures. We're obviously hoping to go to much smaller length scales than even what I've showed you. This is our best effort to date, where we quadruple the resolution of the original lithographic tool and are assembling eight nanometer features on a 16 nanometer pitch. So I'll leave you with one final thought. This technology that we've developed is actually relatively mature uh, and is actively being commercialized in the context of semiconductor manufacturing. But now we're beginning to apply these uh, concepts of directed self-assembly in other areas. These same, you saw that the chips were three-dimensional. One question we ask ourselves is, can we use the same strategy to assemble three-dimensional structures for this type of manufacturing? A second question would be, uh, could we use these uh, strategies for materials for energy applications? The answer turns out to be yes, uh, where we make ion-conducting materials 
uh, for membranes that are used in fuel cells and batteries, for example. And then uh, the sensors that uh, Supratik was talking about, we use chemical patterning and nanoparticles to create structures that you can't make otherwise. And these assemblies of, of nanoparticles have inc incredibly sensitive uh, sensing capabilities, even single molecule sensing. So with that, I'll stop and uh, uh, turn it over to the next speaker.